I'm Julie Zenner along with Dennis Anderson and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. Well, a major summer festival has announced Duluth will become its permanent home. We'll have more on FinFest 2023. The largest freshwater lake in the world is right on our doorstep. Find out why Lake Superior is worth celebrating. And we'll take you out to the old ballpark for a throwback fundraiser for Superior's Bong Veterans Historical Center. Those stories and voices of the region coming up next on Almanac North. Hello and welcome to Almanac North. Thanks for watching. And Denny, it's mid-July and lots of events around the region right now. We're already into mid-summer and there's plenty going on. I don't care what town you live in, something is happening. Lots going on and we'll be talking about some of those things later in the show. But first, let's begin with the headlines. All right, thank you very much. Well, St. Luke's Hospital in Duluth announced this week it signed a letter of intent to affiliate with Wausau-based Aspirus Health. Now that move continues a trend of major hospital consolidations. The two systems plan to complete the affiliation by early next year, at which time Aspirus will consist of 19 hospitals, 130 outpatient locations, and 14,000 employees. Nurses at St. Luke's issued a statement following the affiliation news saying they were pleased that Aspirus plans to recognize their union contract. The merger follows Essentia's recent plan to join with Wisconsin's Marshfield Clinic System, another merger between Twin Cities-based M Health Fairview and South Dakota-based Sanford Health is currently under state scrutiny. Interstate 35 in Duluth will be closed in both directions overnight between 9 p.m. next Thursday and 5 a.m. Friday morning. Detours will take northbound traffic over the Bong Bridge and back to Duluth via the High Bridge, while southbound traffic will detour at 5th Avenue West through the Duluth City streets. Now the overnight closure is needed so crews can pour bridge deck over I-35 for the Twin Ports Interchange project. And the Duluth Air Show fills the sky this weekend at the Duluth Airport. The state's biggest air show features the U.S. Navy Blue Angels, U.S. Air Force demonstration teams, and many other aviation acts. Air show promoters say the event generates $20 million in economic impact, with 75% of attendees coming from outside of Duluth. Well, another big summer event is less than two weeks away in the Twin Ports. FinFest 2023 will start July 26th at the deck and run through Sunday, July 30th. And organizers have announced that Duluth will be the permanent home of the festival moving forward. And here with more is Justin Juntinen, a board member of FinFest USA, which organizes the annual festival. And Craig Randall Johnson is the director of the FinFest Symphony Orchestra. Guys, thank you both for being here. Appreciate having you on the program tonight. Justin, talk to us a little bit about FinFest, if you will. What is it and how does it play a role here? Well, Denny, uh, we believe FinFest and this little country in the north has something to say to the world. So Finland is this country that we sort of now know maybe for saunas, uh, maybe for design and culture, maybe for great orchestra. Um, and over the years, Duluth and the upper Midwest has been a hotbed of sort of this is the this is where that culture has sort of been in the, the water for longest. Right? A lot of Finnish people have a settled lot. here. Haven't <laughs> yeah. They? yeah, my my Finnish last name with too many vowels in it. Right. It's one of those Finnish ones that came over 100 years ago. And now we're going to be not only looking back at sort of the immigrant heritage in the sure. past, but also the future of why is Finland the happiest country in the world? Six years running. I was going to ask you that. <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, lots of reasons. Uh, you'll have to come to FinFest to find out and more. So we're really sort of leaning in. If folks are sort of wondering, what do I do there and what can I be a part of? Well, it's, it's full in terms of the cultural impact. It's design panels. It's mm -hmm. how we study sustainability. It's how we think about our own happiness. <laughs> Uh, and then good food and good music and, of course, in true Finnish fashion, uh, access to sauna, which is something really, really amazing that is one of the best Finnish exports. Uh -huh. Craig, it seems that Finnish people have such a strong sense of pride in their heritage. What is it that, that makes people feel so connected a as Finlanders? We can start with sauna as one, <laughs> but uh, I think it's a connection uh, to the forest, to uh -huh. the ecology, and to the environment in general. 
and also historical reasons, uh, especially the impact with their eastern neighbor mm -hmm. that keep the, keep the culture coming together. But I would say this, um, a number of years ago I went up to the sixth floor of the Sibelius Academy to look at the conducting studio there, because I'm interested in that sort yeah. of thing, and I looked at the bulletin board, and you'd expect to see reviews and articles and so on. What were the reviews of? They were from London, New York, Paris, places like that. That's the field the Finns are operating in. Mm -hmm. That's the level they want to be at, and that's the level they are. And they take pride in quality and in doing the job well, which leads back to the happiness. Mm -hmm. They're able to create a society in which people can function and and act out what they want to do with their lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Talk about some of the things that people will experience at the festival because <clears throat> um, you know it, it, there's a lot of food, a lot of fun, and then there's some serious things as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's really sort of something for everybody, whether it's somebody who wants to come and just enjoy the marketplace and find great food and good Nordic wares that are being sold, uh, or you're really interested in learning something there. Mm -hmm. uh, we have folks from uh, some of the best from Finland and some of the world's sort of leaders around what's happening around NATO and Finland, right? These big tectonic shifts in our modern world and political world are going to be talked about there at Finland. Folks who want to learn about sustainability and design, we're going to learn from these experts in the field saying, hey, what does it mean to be in a place like Duluth and being a shipping port? And learning from experts from Finland that are mm -hmm. saying, wait, we can do shipping in a more sustainable way. We can think about our forests in a more sustainable way. So there's sort of, I would say, something for everybody, whether it's uh, me with young kids bringing the family, we're gonna come and have fun and there'll be things to do there. Uh, or you're really interested in great music and classical music. You know, I mean, we have sort of everything on. Everything's on the website too. It's, it's hard to sort of tell everything. Mm -hmm. Go to the website, check out the full schedule. We'd be honored to host you. Wonderful. Many people don't realize it, but Douglas and Bayfield counties in Wisconsin have some of the oldest Finnish farming communities really in the United States. What brought them there particularly? Yeah, I'll, uh, can I tackle one piece of this? Yeah, sure. Uh, opportunity at that time. I think so often we look at the forests and we say, hey, there was, you know, they look a lot like Finland sure. up here, uh, but the jobs were available at this time, you know? And so people were selling, we were just talking about the Brule area. Mm -hmm. And these are the spots from there all the way up through the Iron Range and past where there was opportunity on the mines and the mills and the docks. What would you add? Well, my grandfather first worked uh, in the Keweenaw on the copper mines and then had a career in the iron mines in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And he knew many people who were blacklisted from the mines. And they ended up working, uh, they, they did farming and found other occupations. This was another way that the, that the Finns settled here. And I think it's because the area is much like Finland in many ways. So this was a natural place to come. You know, why go to Illinois and Missouri or somewhere? Go somewhere where you feel comfortable and at home and know how to work with the environment. Mm -hmm. Got to hear about the, the FinFest Symphony because you've got a... Yes, a the concert will be on Friday night, <clears throat> July 28th at 7.30, the auditorium at the deck. And you can get tickets at tick, uh, through Ticketmaster. Um, or from the, uh, the deck ticket office uh, at the Irvin, mm -hmm. which has moved there for the summer. Yeah, so the, the concert contains two pieces by Sibelius, of course, his very popular Karelia Suite and then Finlandia at the end with chorus. And then secondly is the U.S. premiere, the first performance ever in this country of Jaco Kusisto's Piano Concerto. Uh, Kusisto, who unfortunately passed away of a brain tumor recently, uh, played by uh, an American pianist, Mackenzie Melamed, uh, now living in Helsinki. He's an Avery Fisher Grant Award winner. The guy's a super player. He's played with the Philadelphia Orchestra, mm -hmm. the Hell City Symphony, many. So this is a new piece to hear. And then a suite from Leve Maratoya's opera, the Ostrobothnians, uh, which was 
the first internationally important opera. In and with that, we have to leave it. Guys, it sounds like it's going to be a wonderful time. Thank you very, very much for being here tonight. Thanks for Thank having me. Thank you very Craig, much. Justin, Appreciate it. This week, the Duluth Huskies partnered with a local group to bring baseball history to life and raise money for Superior's Richard I. Bong Veterans Historical Center. Producer Megan McGarvey brings us the story from the old ball field. At Wade Stadium, the Duluth Huskies got to revisit a piece of baseball's historic past. During World War II, um, when everyone, all the men were off at war, there was an opportunity for women to form a professional baseball league, um, which is what we're trying to replicate today while having a baseball event with the Huskies. Well, we're, a, we're always happy to partner with the Border Town Bettys. They do a great job of kind of keeping the era alive and on, on the forefront of people's minds. And um, during World War II, what they're, today they're honoring the uh, Rockford Peaches, who during World War II were trailblazers just as well as any Rosie the Riveter. And what they did probably gave even more women at that time the courage to go out and uh, work in the, in, the, in the workplace and maybe take over a man's role where baseball was traditionally a man's game and they came out and proved that they could do it. And uh, that gave a lot of girls a lot of confidence to, to go forward and to help the war effort. And that's what, a, that's what the country needed at the time. They stepped up big time. So you might think it's trivial just to play baseball, but what it meant so much across the country and to, to girls at that age and that impression to, and let them know that, hey, maybe we can do anything. So. <laughs> the Border Town Bettys were formed in 2019 just as a women's social club, as a way to uplift and empower women through charity work in the Twin Ports. Um, we've done all sorts of things from raising money to CASDA, raising money, we do a lot with the Bong Center, a little bit of everything, raising money in both Duluth and Superior for other nonprofit organizations while giving it a little vintage flair. We really try to focus on vintage style and vintage fashion and the positive parts of the 1940s and 50s while not having those vintage values. Um, we're focused on helping out in the community and great partnerships with the LGBTQIA community and women empowerment. And we really do not carry the vintage vibe forward with our morals. <laughs> we love to uplift and help everybody in the community and that's what we hope to show everybody today. Along with the fun baseball antics, the Bettys also took photos and sold American flags to benefit the Richard I. Bong Veterans Historical Center in Superior. Uh, the Richard Bong Historical Center is a museum that honors the history of, of America's ace of H's, aces, Richard Ira Bong. Um, we also tell the story of, of all veterans who served across all conflicts, uh, mainly from World War II going forward. Richard Bond was basically a local boy made good. He, during uh, World War II, he became as, as famous as anybody in the nation. Um, he was born in Poplar, um, grew up around Superior in the Superior area, and uh, went to Poplar High School. And then when he enlisted in the Army Air Corps, he, uh, he quickly emerged as one of the top pilots in the nation. And by the end of the war, he had shot down more aircraft than anybody had done before or since. He broke the existing record of 26 victories, and no one ever tied him or passed him since. And he's still America's ace of aces. And he's, he's a local boy. He's right here. And uh, he had a profound effect on one of the major events in our nation's history. Well, the, the, the main importance of, of telling veterans stories is, like I say, it's so that we always remember. We remember what they sacrificed for us, what they did for us. You know, many times they, people left their lives behind and at a very, very young age and went out and fought for a cause that uh, they believed in. And um, we need to honor that, those stories and we need to always remember those people and, and then who, some who even gave the ultimate sacrifice. But even anybody who served at any time has, out, has sacrificed for their country. And it's very important that we honor them and, and tell their story. We want veterans to come out tonight and uh, take in a ball game. And uh, it's America's pastime. And just to celebrate, celebrate our great life of freedom that we have here in the United States.
it's time to honor the largest freshwater lake in the world at Lake Superior Day this Sunday. Events at Barker's Island in Superior will both celebrate and educate about the greatest of the Great Lakes. Joining us with more is Luciana Ranelli, Education Coordinator with the Lakes of with the Lake Superior National Estuarine Research Reserve in Superior. And welcome, Luciana. Thanks for being here. Yeah, you bet. Thank you. So why set aside a day to celebrate Lake Superior? Well, Lake Superior is a lot to the people who live in Duluth and Superior and all in the Lake Superior Basin near us. I mean, um, it's a lot of people's drinking water. There's a lot of jobs connected with the lake. There's a lot of it. It gives us food and moderates our climate, and it's really just a centerpiece of living here. So what is Lake Superior Day? What's going to happen? Well, Lake Superior Day is celebrated in lake-adjacent communities all the way around the lake in Canada and the United States the third Sunday in July every year. And so Superior hosts a Lake Superior Day celebration hosted by the Lake Superior Reserve, and people can expect to come down for a party and learning and community with some live music from T. Galaxy and the Gemstones and Lake Superior learning booths from people doing research or restoration work or who are sharing about research on tribal lands. Where um, does all this take place? Oh, all of this is on Barker's Island in Superior, Wisconsin. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. I read that there's also going to be a spotted knapweed pull. Oh, yes, yes, that is earlier in the morning. So uh -huh. the Lake Superior Day celebration is from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. on Barker's Island. And one way to also take care of the lake is to uh, spot a knapweed is a plant that is non-local to the area and is growing a lot on Wisconsin Point. And so people can join at 9 a.m. Um, on a parking lot on Wisconsin Point to help pull spotted knapweed and give some other plants on Wisconsin Point a chance to grow. What's the cost to attend? Zero. Zero? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even better. I mean, if people do have to bring money to purchase food, but otherwise everything is free. Mm -hmm. What makes the St. Louis River Estuary and this part of Lake Superior so special? Because your organization really does a lot of uh, monitoring and researching and, and partnering with people to, to really advance it. Yeah, well, estuaries are hubs of abundance of food and life for people and other plants and organisms in the environment. And so the St. Louis River is the largest tributary in the United States into Lake Superior. And Lake Superior is the largest by surface area body of fresh water in the world. Mm -hmm. And there's like about 600,000 people who live around Lake Superior even directly. So the St. Louis River as it like slows down and widens and then flows into Lake Superior. It means a lot here and it also means a lot for people elsewhere in the lake. Mm -hmm. Luciana, what kind of kids activities will be available? Oh, well, there are stand up paddle board demonstrations <laughs> and I mean, that's for all ages. And there will be paper bag puppet crafting of some of the plants and animals or whatever people want to create um, that live in the estuary. If there's one thing that you would really want people to walk away from Lake Superior Day thinking about or knowing, what would it be? Oh my, I think the, the diverse ways that people just love and appreciate and learn about the lake is what I want people to walk away from. I think they will have their, their own personal connection with the water around here probably validated. And if they meet one new person or hear about one other connection that's different from theirs to the fresh water here, that's what I take, hope they take away. Just and tell them, go ahead. No, I just very quickly, um, what are you seeing in terms of the lake? Are, are changes occurring in it? Well, you can come to Lake Superior Day to find out, <laughs> Julie. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was about the perfect length answer. <laughs> Luciana, thank you so much. Good luck with Lake Superior Day. Thank you. I hope lots of folks come Luciana, thank you very kindly. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, it's time now for Voices of the Region when we hear from an area journalist about topics in the news. Our guest this week is Iron Range columnist and author Aaron Brown. Well, it's been a busy summer of news on the Iron Range. Uh, I think one of the bigger, maybe under the radar stories is uh, something that happened with the New Range Minerals, formerly the Polymet Project in Hoyt Lakes. Its New Range is the new title of a 
the initiative that now includes tech resources uh, and, and other mining interests in developing non-ferrous copper, nickel, and other minerals uh, mining operations in Northeastern Minnesota. We've known about that story for a long time. Uh, less understood is the fact that Glencore, the world's largest mining company, is uh, really the money behind that project. And now uh, with a new development that the company has announced, uh, Glencore will be making a bid and it will likely be approved because Glencore already owns a majority of, of Polymet. Uh, Glencore will become the uh, private uh, owner of, of what was soon to be previously known as Polymet. Um, this just solidifies uh, this large mining company as the more dominant uh, element in the in the story. Uh, it could have a few meanings. Uh, we know from last month that uh, uh, a big setback was incurred by the project when the Army Corps of Engineers pulled permits uh, for the new range project. Glencore, being the sole owner, could come in with either a more aggressive approach to uh, the permitting process, or they might reorganize and, and uh, reorient what this project might become. It also allows them to hold on to the site and the assets of the project for a little bit longer and see what transpires in the future. For the last almost 20 years, a project has been brewing near Nashwalk to build an iron ore and maybe even an iron production or steel facility in Minnesota. Well, that has transpired into the Masabi Metallics projects, which recently lost its mineral leases um, at a state meeting last month. And uh, those leases were awarded to Cleveland Cliffs, uh, the operator of Hibbing Taconite and a major iron ore producer on the Masabi. Uh, that's not the end of the story because Masabi Metallics has now sued the state to try to get those leases back. And this week, uh, Itasca County, the Itasca County Board and the city of Nashwalk have announced that they are gonna to try to add on to the lawsuit. They're gonna sign on to the lawsuit. That's kind of significant in that it's surprising. It, the Masabi Metallics has just been dealt blow after blow and uh, the state uh, really frankly refuses to work with that company. And uh, the local governments, nonetheless, are trying to stick with that company, uh, perhaps uh, in a bid to, you know, sunk costs, kind of re recover what they've invested personally into the success of that potential mine project. Now, it remains to be seen how that will turn out, but it does indicate that there's going to be a bit more writhing um, on this story for, for months and maybe even years to come. Nevertheless, the leases are in the possession of Cliffs. And it will be to them to determine how they want to use uh, that property going forward. This summer, for many of us in northern Minnesota, has been the summer of smoke. You might recall the heavy uh, smoke from Canadian wildfires that settled down on our region uh, on a few different uh, occasions this summer. And so wildfire might be on your mind. It's uh, an Increasing problem uh, in, in North America, um, more dry weather, more hot weather, and uh, that has produced more fuel and uh, more conditions that produce wildfire out west. And we have wildfires encroaching uh, times in, in our region as well. And you might not realize that we're a major staging area for the suppression of wildfires in uh, Ontario and Wisconsin, Minnesota, and our, our whole general region. And uh, Part of the state bonding bill this year funded a, a large project at the Hibbing, the Range Regional Airport in Hibbing. Um, and near there, there is a, a interagency fire uh, air base. Those planes had been um, not housed here though for the last uh, season because of uh, infrastructure pro problems at the Hibbing base. Well, those are gonna get fixed and that the planes had been staging out of Brainerd and now that's gonna be moving back up to Hibbing. And that will put uh, these planes closer to the action where wildfires happen. And so should a wildfire break out, like a small fire broke out in the Boundary Waters earlier this year, now um, the agencies will be able to fight that fire with a little bit more proximity to the, to the action.
out of time, but you can keep up with Almanac North by following us on Facebook and Twitter. Keep an eye on the PBS North website for program updates, news about the station, and our upcoming events. And don't forget to download the PBS video app to watch your favorite PBS programs anytime you'd like. And Denny, there's no shortage of events around the region this weekend. Looks like pretty good weather. I think it's going to be, you know, no matter where you look this week, you're going to find something going on someplace. And the weather's supposed to be pretty decent. Maybe some showers on Sunday, but Saturday's mm -hmm. looking really good, I guess. It was kind of fun driving over here tonight. I could already see some of the acts from the air show. Oh, of course. Starting to warm up. Yeah. And so that's that's always a pretty exciting time. And <laughs> that's today. for Hopefully sure. Hopefully lots it of is folks indeed. will be able and that the weather will cooperate with that. Right. All right. Well, for Dennis Anderson and the crew at Almanac North, I'm Julie Zenner. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next time.